Friday early afternoon, early evening in Europe, it's Space Cafe Canada time. Our Space Cafe Canada by Dr. Jessica West will begin soon. As always, we really appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. I'm Torsten, the publisher of Spacewatch.Global and today the master of ceremony. And we are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in the geopolitical context. I would like to thank to all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. With Dr. Jessica West, senior researcher at the Project Plactrius, we found a great friend and a wonderful host for our outreach in Canada. I know many of you are familiar already with our website, the bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. And for all our fans of audio content, we also have new episodes in the Space Cafe radio on the road in Brussels at the EU Space Conference. And so, for instance, short talks with Alexander Gers and Will Marshall by uh, Chiara Munter. We also keep our fanship open for you to support us actively and become a real space watcher. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, we have an archive on our web page and the event section and on YouTube. And with that, my job is done and I'm handing over to your host today in snowy, cold Waterloo. Jessica, over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Torsten. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to Space Cafe Canada. Uh, Valentin, the video was inspiring. You captured so many of my favorite people on this topic, and I'm glad that we can add Canadian voices to this conversation. So welcome back to Space Cafe Canada. I'm joining you from Project Plowshares, which is a Canadian Peace and Research Institute. We've been active on global space governance discussions for almost two decades now. I would like to say that we're located at the University of Waterloo, uh, which itself is located on the Haldeman Track, land that was granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River here in Ontario. Our last episode was focused on the debris implications uh, of outer space and ASAT testing in particular. And we're gonna pick up this theme today with a discussion on arms control and diplomacy in space. To do this, we have one of the world's top experts on the topic joining us. Um, please help me welcome Canada's former ambassador to the United Nations and the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, Paul Meyer. Paul's career spans not only diplomacy, but also academia and advocacy. He is a respected expert on the topic of arms control in space, as well as other domains, including cyber, and also a longtime mentor to many of us in the space community, both here in Canada and all around the world. Today, we can find Paul teaching and researching at the School for International Studies at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's also a founding fellow of the Outer Space Institute. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, great to be with you, Jessica. Let's get started. Your bio is a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> You've done a lot. And um, I thought we would begin with how I got to know you, which is in your role as Canada's ambassador for disarmament. It's a position for which you're still very well known. Can you give us some context to this, the role and the work of the Conference on Disarmament when it comes to outer space issues and, and sort of how Canada fits into this? Yes, well, the, um, the Conference on Disarmament, uh, for those of the listeners who aren't familiar uh, with it, is a 65 member state uh, forum in uh, Geneva uh, that is ostensibly the United Nations sole the forum for the negotiation of multilateral arms control and disarmament uh, agreements. And uh, it had um, the agenda item of PEROS, uh, our uh, familiar acronym for the prevention of an arms race in outer space, on its agenda since 1982. It has been um, active for a period of time um, with a dedicated committee of the conference from uh, 1985 to 1995 uh, on this subject. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a relatively productive period of time in the history of space security in terms of 
various uh, exchange of ideas. Uh, but um, alas, there wasn't a consensus, and I should always emphasize that uh, the CD worked on a strict consensus basis. Uh, there was not a consensus within the committee for a specific uh, course of action on it. Some states um, valued moving immediately to a uh, negotiation of a legal uh, agreement, specifically on an issue uh, that has uh, uh, raised its profile more recently, uh, i.e. anti-satellite weapons, uh, but others uh, felt that it was premature to do that, that discussions of various options was all that was possible. In any event, uh, the committee ended, uh, wasn't able to be renewed. Uh, CD works on, on uh, annual renewals of mandates. So uh, this committee wasn't able to be renewed in 1996. And indeed that was uh, the last uh, year that uh, anything uh, of significance was achieved by the conference in terms of official work. That was the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in, in, that, in that year. And for uh, reasons I won't uh, go into now, uh, the CD, uh, uh, the Paros item got caught up in a much broader uh, disagreement uh, within the conference on what should be the priorities and uh, for program of work and has not been able to, uh, in fact, agree on that for the last 25 years, which also explains why a new uh, uh, the diplomatic four are being explored uh, currently. So uh, that's a, a little bit of the background on, on the CD. Uh, in terms of Canada's involvement, I think it took uh, really uh, two uh, prime motivations. One, uh, we were uh, early uh, user of space technology. Uh, Alouette, our first uh, telecommunication satellite launched in 1962. Um, you all know that Canada is a vast land, somewhat sparsely populated, and uh, so the um, the benefits of having uh, satellites uh, for uh, functions like telecommunications, like remote sensing, uh, were pretty uh, obvious uh, to uh, to Canadian authorities, and that I think was uh, a motivation that has continued to the present day. Also alongside a longstanding uh, advocacy and activism on uh, issues of multilateral arms control and disarmament, uh, where it was felt that uh, Canadian national security, but indeed global security, uh, was best served if uh, uh, competition could be tampered down and uh, international cooperation through cooperative security arrangements uh, fostered. So uh, that's a little bit of uh, the background. Uh, for for you and your uh, and the listeners. So it's been sort of a long and bumpy, long road on this topic with not a whole lot of progress. Um, but you've continued to be deeply involved in the issue even after you know retiring from your role as ambassador. Um, you're an academic. You're an advocate. You're an advisor. You're an institutional entrepreneur. All of these activities linked to. Um, to the topic of arms control in outer space. So what is it about, about space security that keeps you so engaged personally? Yeah, I would say a, a few factors, Jessica. Uh, one is uh, that uh, I've always been uh, curious about how the international system accommodates uh, new technologies. Uh, and uh, we can obviously see uh, uh, in uh, over the years, uh, going back to telegraphy and the creation of the, one of the first international organizations in terms of the International Telecommunications Union, of course, it initially was the International Telegram Union, uh, and uh, it uh, has, in a sense, taken on board the, you know, the development of radio and the television. And, uh, now, of course, it has a role in terms of allocation of slots for uh, telecommunication satellites. Uh, uh, so that was, I think, one uh, element uh, that uh, space, though it's not uh, a completely new area, it, its exploitation uh, was uh, relatively recent. And then, uh, and maybe this was uh, uh, 
des formations professionnelles, as one would say, as a, as a diplomat, I was always sort of dissatisfied with uh, the relative investment in conflict prevention, as opposed to uh, engaging in conflict or post-conflict mopping up efforts. And uh, uh, it always uh, seemed to me, why, why haven't we been able to find the right formulas uh, to prevent conflicts that were looming around us and were quite clearly going to be uh, um, detrimental to our interests. And so uh, I think that also uh, led me to have this, uh, this interest in uh, how uh, space, particularly as it's become so much more important uh, for global uh, well-being as well as global security, and where, you know, what you know, 30 years ago was still a, a club of just a few basically uh, advanced industrial countries uh, is now um, much more equitably sort of uh, engaged. We have, uh, I think now something like 80 countries that own or operate satellites and uh, every country on the, on the globe is in a way a... Uh, uh, consumer of uh, satellite-enabled uh, services. Uh, so uh, this uh, too, I think, uh, demands uh, then efforts at trying to preserve outer space for peaceful purposes, for ensuring that these, I think, uh, uh, ever more important benefits can continue uh, to be uh, enjoyed uh, by citizens around the world. Uh, without fear of uh, uh, man-made threats. Yes, I would say that um, the importance of space really stands out. You and I worked together for many years on the Space Security Index, which is behind me, and the size of that book <laughs> just over sort of the last five years of publication grew tremendously trying to capture all of the activity that was taking place. Um, and certainly your point about preventing conflict uh, strikes a chord with events this week. When we talk about arms control though, in space particularly, what are we talking about? What is the problem? We, we have an outer space treaty. Um, so are we talking about a, a legal issue or are we talking about a technological issue? Um, what's the problem that needs to be solved? Well, I think we're talking about uh military, legal, political, technological, uh, they're all related. Uh, but you're quite right uh, to note that on one hand, um, the international community is well served uh, by having an early foundational treaty uh, in the Outer Space uh, Treaty of 1967 uh, that specifies some really vital, I would say, conflict prevention uh, provisions. Uh, notably that outer space is a global commons uh, beyond uh, any claim uh, of a sovereign, national appro appropriation or claim of sovereignty. And when you uh, recall how many wars down here on earth have been a function of uh, clashing claims of sovereignty or territorial disputes, uh, you can appreciate how uh, important uh, that provision was uh, as a uh, conflict prevention uh, measure. Also, the specific orientation um, of the treaty is for the peaceful purposes. Uh, space activity is for peaceful purposes and uh, for the benefit and in the interests of all countries. Again, uh, a uh, crucial uh, principle. And the, the treaty itself is, is, um, is replete with uh, uh, elements of international cooperation, recognizing that this was a, an exciting and potentially uh, hugely beneficial environment for cooperative human activity. Of course, there's also uh, very uh, specific uh, uh, prohibitions uh, regarding uh, any orbiting of weapons of mass destruction, uh, any uh, militarization of the moon or other celestial bodies. So uh, altogether, I think it, it has uh, been uh, a key um, foundation for a legal regime on outer space. There's 111 states parties to it. 
Now that said, it has some weaknesses. Well, one of them is that it did not, as a very early multilateral treaty, it didn't make any provision for follow-up or institutional support, uh, which is now uh, a standard in any uh, multilateral agreement, i.e. Um, there's no uh, provision for an annual conference of states parties, again, a norm. Um, and uh, this uh, has, I think, um, been uh, problematic for the treaty in that they uh, have not been able, the states parties have never once been able to meet together to talk about the state of health of the treaty, whether uh, other steps might be uh, needed. Um, and in that, uh, in that way, uh, I still think uh, this is one uh, very useful step that could be undertaken by any uh, uh, state party to the treaty is, is sponsor a meeting of those uh, states to get together. So uh, there are those, um, I think, who though uh, have problems with the constraints that the treaty uh, does uh, provide and are trying to wiggle their way out of it, uh, partly by ignoring it, um, you know, partly by uh, saying uh, that our, our activity is, um, well, military is uh, non-aggressive, it's, it's not a threat to any other state. Uh, so we I do have to, I think, appreciate that uh, while that regime, I think, is crucial and uh, of enduring value, it needs to be reinforced and consolidated and made more effective. And indeed, as, uh, as you know well, uh, Jessica, there's been uh, a annual resolution adopted within the General Assembly uh, on Paros that basically uh, says exactly that, uh, that uh, while this regime is great and it would be a grave uh, threat to international peace and security uh, if an arms race got underway, uh, that uh, one needed to uh, enhance the effectiveness of the regime through further measures. And uh, that, um, as a piece of declaratory policy, um, is universally supported. I mean, it has enjoyed almost universal support uh, uh, over the 40 years that it's been on the, uh, on the agenda of the General Assembly. Uh, only the United States and Israel for a time either voted no or abstained. But last year, even uh, those countries came on board and we actually had this Paros uh, resolution adopted uh, with all the votes, uh, a consensus expression of the will of the international community. The problem, and I, I, here I note, uh, drawing from my own experience um, in diplomacy, unfortunately, sometimes uh, states um, can use declarative policy as this is the box I need to check to show my uh, good standing. But I don't really have to do anything about it once I check it. And so that each uh, year duly support it, but did those further measures uh, get put forward? Or was there active uh, diplomacy to try to develop these steps that would help consolidate and reinforce the legal regime? No, and uh, this is where we get at times a problem of what I term uh, ritualized support. So it became a kind of ritual uh, to uh, vote yes and then uh, not really do anything of uh, major importance uh, afterwards. And it took external events, uh, notably the revival of destructive uh, ASAT testing, um, beginning with uh, the China in 2007, sort of has brought this back uh, again. It prompted some uh, short-term uh, efforts of initiatives uh, that really didn't uh, pan out, uh, but I think uh, it can serve as uh, an impetus. You know, at last, sometimes um, uh, rising tensions and fears uh, can have a positive effect on re-energizing more abundant diplomacy. And I think we're seeing signs of that here. So 40 years is a long time. I think we have people in the audience who are not yet 40 years old. What are some of the key points of differences or the cleavages that have been obstacles to, to momentum on this or to agreement, I suppose, rather than than just momentum, because there's more than just sort of ritualized support that's 
probably a lot of countries, but there's also disagreement. Yes, I, I think uh, part of the reality about uh, man's exploit exploitation of outer space has been this it's sort of Janus face. You know, on one hand, you have international cooperation, you know, proud in some ways, very really remarkable achievements. Uh, international Space Station clearly is one of the, the key manifestations of that, but uh, much more extensive. But on the other hand, in parallel, you've also had uh, efforts to achieve military superiority uh, in the space realm. And uh, those two uh, are in, uh, continue to be in tension. And I think uh, it underlines uh, some of the uh, failure to make uh, progress because there are those uh, who uh, uh, believe that uh, this, so they enjoy military advantage that could somehow be constrained or perhaps neutralized through um, international agreements. And therefore, they're uh, loath to enter into them. You know, during my, my time uh, in, uh, in Geneva, this is 2003 to 2007, uh, I remember the uh, American Perm rep often would uh, cut short uh, any discussion on Paros by saying, well, there's no arms race in outer space, so therefore there's no need to have any arms control there. You know? and, and it's, it's taken time for um, uh, the situation to evolve. And, and maybe uh, you know, states were less concerned about this gap between declaratory policy and the reality when there wasn't um, sharp manifestations of counter space capabilities being uh, developed and tested. But as I know that since 2007, this is definitely not the case. Uh, we've had now uh, four uh, spacefaring nations uh, uh, demonstrate destructive ASAT uh, testing uh, with all its uh, deleterious uh, consequences. And uh, this, as I suggested earlier, may prove a bit of a spur to once again try to see if cooperative uh, security approaches can be achieved. Yeah, I like to, or I, I think I've referred to the, there's no arm race in space, nothing to see here is the, the fog of peace myself. Um, and, and as an obstacle, I'm going to take an audience question just because it fits right into what you're speaking to now, and also a key area of your expertise. Um, someone is asking about the role of um, TCBMs, non-binding agreements, and we're going to move on to the sort of the upcoming process, but the question is specifically about the role of the MTCR and the, the Hague Code of Conduct and how these fit into um, discussions and, and efforts to prevent an arms race in outer space. Sure yeah, I mean, uh, yes. for you know, a long time, uh, I would say this is the legally binding versus politically binding um, debate. Uh, and there are adherents on both sides. And frankly, there are some good uh, reasons uh, for those who prefer one over the other. Uh, and in my mind, uh, this has been my approach for a long time. I don't. I'd rather not get hung up over the status, ultimately. I think it's more important that you have agreement on the substance, i.e. specific measures. And if um, countries are showing goodwill and good faith in signing up to a specific measure of restraint or notification or transparency or whatever it is, then I think it's actually of secondary uh, significance whether that measure is framed as a, as a legally binding uh, measure or a politically binding one. So uh, I uh, would see a merit in uh, if there are significant measures and can be agreed uh, to, of course, um, proceed. Uh, you, you mentioned transparency and conference building uh, measures. Uh, and there was uh, an important consensus um, set of recommendations from a UN group of governmental experts uh, from 2013 with a number of these. I'd also like to point out that uh, though they weren't called TCBMs, 
the Outer Space Treaty has a number of such uh, provisions in terms of encouraging visits to uh, space launch sites, uh, facilities, uh, the consultations, uh, uh, cooperative scientific exchanges. So I think there's a menu of steps that are out there uh, if uh, countries are really uh, desirous of seizing uh, upon them. And I hope, and maybe we'll get to this uh, shortly, the, the new diplomatic forum that has been launched um, may uh, provide uh, some early agreements of that sort. Yeah, and sorry, that question was by Rojo. And also the context of it leads us to think about the context for space arms control and whether or not space is separate and unique in this, or is it tied into other sort of conflict prevention and arms control dynamics? I mean, the, the, the tools he mentioned, the tools mentioned were related to missiles, but how do other areas of arms control, and that will lead us into current events a little bit more, but how is space integrated in the broader dynamics, I suppose, of conflict and arms control? Well, it has a, a significant role. Uh, clearly now, uh, contemporary military uh, operations are heavily dependent on uh, space uh, assets. Uh, and this uh, has uh, importance across the board. I, I feel a particular uh, uh, vulnerability it can lie in uh, the role of satellites and early warning systems, particularly when you relate that uh, to uh, nuclear weapons and uh, nuclear forces. Uh, and uh, I uh, had done a, a paper for Unidir in which I talk about a devil's triangle between uh, space security efforts on one hand, but then uh, nuclear uh, disarmament, nuclear uh, weapons policies, and ballistic missile defense on the other. And for those uh, students of this, you'll see at various times, of course, uh, there are ballistic about space-based uh, uh, missile interceptors and uh, how uh, concerns about the reliability of uh, uh, so-called uh, you know, second strike forces, uh, if uh, early warning uh, systems were uh, disabled or disrupted through uh, anti-satellite weapons or other means. And you know, if this wasn't uh, a little disconcerting enough, you can have the overlay of uh, cyber operations on, on this, uh, which of course uh, can be disruptive both of normal satellite functioning, uh, but also uh, in uh, some uh, some terrifying scenarios um, in terms of, uh, again, the nuclear forces, uh, a good number of which, of course, uh, remain on a, a high state of alert, uh, in which uh, uh, there the could be a, a launch you know, within 30 minutes of, of perceptions of uh, an incoming attack. So uh, this um, is indeed uh, an increasingly a complex uh, uh, mixture that does uh, at a minimum uh, pose new challenges uh, to efforts at cooperative uh, security and arms control. Though, I, again, I would also emphasize it provides greater motivation to doing something on this score. So just for anyone who's watching and wants to access the paper, I put a link in the chat so it's uh, easy to find and download. It's worth a read. Um, before we sort of dive more firmly into current events. Are there any missed opportunities that you see or that, that we as a community should regret um, that have ended us up where we are today? You know, if only type things. Well, of course, uh, I think uh, uh, there's no short of missed opportunities. I, I would say this was uh, a problem uh, that uh, was uh, becoming ever more apparent. Uh, Obviously, the uh, vast uh, growth in uh, satellites in orbit, uh, courtesy of our private sector uh, uh, entrepreneurs, among other, um, it is uh, uh, we, I think, have been guilty of a certain lethargy. Um, I think uh, mid middle powers, powers and spe specifically could have done more. You know, when there's great power rivalry, uh, 
particularly uh, acute in the space area, let's say between countries like the United States, Russia, China. I think it's incumbent on uh, other powers with a certain degree of space expertise, capabilities, uh, diplomatic strengths, et cetera, uh, to uh, step up to the plate and show that um, there are alternatives uh, to uh, increasing um, an increasing arms race in space, you know, which is all pledged to prevent. And yet you know, many of us seem to be uh, passive uh, onlookers as it uh, gains in uh, scope and magnitude. Uh, so uh, it, there is a, a relationship there. Now, I think one um, point where there is agreement, and this is, I think, helpful for prospects going forward, is particularly with uh, uh, destructive weapons, with de anything that would add to the debris problem. Space debris is an equal opportunity destroyer of, of assets. So uh, uh, there's no way that if you blow something up in space, uh, you can be confident uh, that the uh, debris fragments uh, thus formed are not going to destroy your space assets. And I think uh, that, uh, commonality has uh, a led to a certain degree of restraint uh, among uh, those space powers that have such capabilities. Uh, but B, I like to think, uh, does provide uh, some common ground that should make uh, at least steps to uh, prevent new debris causing weaponry to be introduced in space, uh, possible and uh, diplomatic agreement around that. Certainly, and well, as you're aware, the Outer Space Institute has been part of this conversation, and we also have a new a new process that sort of has started at the United Nations and and is on pause and will hopefully resume again soon. But the creation of an open-ended working group to make recommendations about possible new norms of behavior related to military activities in outer space and outer space security. Um, how does that fit into this picture? Um, how did we get here and what is the goal of this? Well, um, I'm uh, being a believer in the times a practitioner of creative diplomacy. And I, I think uh, here we've seen an example of that with uh, upon a, a UK initiative, uh, we had uh, rapid uh, support and indeed uh, uh, authorization to establish a new diplomatic forum uh, on reducing space threats through norms, uh, rules and principles of responsible behaviors. Uh, and this uh, taking the form of an open-ended working group, um, which uh, had an organizer organizational meeting in, in Geneva uh, uh, earlier this month and is uh, supposed to uh, work over 2022 and 2023 and report back if it can uh, to the General Assembly then. Um, and I think it um, has a value for uh, and came about for uh, three main reasons. One is that it offers uh, an escape route from the straitjacket of the Conference on Disarmament. Because this uh, uh, process, while it's supposed to be operating under a consensus basis, was established uh, by the General Assembly of the UN, and that assembly works on majority vote basis. So even though there was opposition to its creation, it was created. And uh, I think, uh, as the title suggests, it's open to any UN member state uh, that wants to uh, participate. Uh, and in that way, way it's also a more inclusive vehicle uh, than the, the CD, which, uh, as I know, has 65 uh, member states. Uh, I think it also uh, represents a new tack and potentially a promising tack in putting uh, an emphasis on control of conduct rather than control of specific weapon systems. And uh, in this way, uh, may be a way of getting around some of the uh, protracted uh, disagreements on definitions. Uh, uh, and uh, third, 
I think um, it suggests and draws, I think, a certain kind of strength and credibility from earlier work in another uh, area of the UN, uh, um, in another part of the UN force, so to speak, there's been a number of years working up what? Norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, and uh, there has been some success uh, in that field through another open-ended working group process. Uh, so those um, three elements, I think, all um, speak uh, favorably to the prospects of this uh, new open-ended working group. Yes, and there was another question slash comment in the in the Q and A by Rojo, who pointed to the you know the role and the expertise of Canada in copious developing rules of behavior. So I see these themes hopefully coming together towards momentum. Now you mentioned that the working group is created under the mandate of the General Assembly, which doesn't require consensus, it requires a majority vote, but the rules of the group itself are, are working through consensus. Do you see, what do you see as areas where you think this might be feasible? where all of the states who are yeah, yes. may agree. <laughs> well, I, I would identify, uh, as the Elvis Space Institute uh, did uh, in its uh, open letter uh, of last summer, uh, recognizing that a ban on the testing of uh, kinetic or debris-causing anti-satellite weapons would be a very uh, concrete and very constructive measure to uh, have. And uh, that, uh, in my mind, um, could represent some uh, low-hanging fruit uh, for harvesting uh, in that OEWG. Uh, as noted earlier, uh, avoiding additional debris uh, is uh, to the benefit of all those operating space assets. Uh, and it is, I think, uh, therefore, a very good place to uh, start looking at. And aligned with my earlier remarks, you know, in my mind, it will be less important whether such a measure uh, enjoys a, a legal status or just a political status. And what's crucial is that it's agreed upon. And there are ways I think where such a measure could be uh, uh, adequately verified as well, which would help build, of course, general confidence in the uh, uh, willingness of states to cooperate on this. And there are, of course, uh, many other ideas that uh, could be uh, put in as part of that. Uh, there are uh, efforts of transparency and, and exchange, uh, other uh, realms where some restraint might be uh, possible. So uh, that's, uh, I would say, uh, uh, near term, I, I would hope, uh, focus. So we've already had a little bit of a, a hiccup. Uh, the first week of substantive discussions has been postponed following difference of opinion on interpreting the mandate of the working group and um, specifically Russia, um, you know, working the rules of consensus has pushed the first meeting to May from February. Um, and so there've been a lot of questions, I think some, in the, some here, but also on, on Twitter and um, I guess in social media in general about what the role of Russia might be in, um, in the working group and in diplomacy on this issue going forward, especially this year uh, with events the way they are. And I know we were gonna talk about that last week at an event we were at, then I didn't get to hear your thoughts. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and, and what you see possibly unfolding this year, um, specifically when it comes to diplomacy in the open-ended working group and we'll, we'll shift to some other diplomatic questions after. Well, of course, uh, we're all still recovering, I think, from the shock of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and which obviously is a, a massive you know, violation of international law and uh, respect for um, uh, sovereign independence of, of states. Uh, so uh, 
in, in hindsight, maybe it's just as well that uh, we're not launching immediately into the work of the OEWG and that we won't have uh, the uh, first meeting uh, until substantive meeting until May. Uh, you know, diplomacy uh, has to uh, keep active even at times when, you know, the guns have started to go off and uh, it represents uh, uh, also ways of uh, providing off ramps from military escalation and, and, and war. And I think uh, that's uh, relevant in this uh, case as well. I come back uh, once again to the clear common interest uh, of all space uh, users, of which Russia clearly figures significantly in uh, trying to uh, minimize threats uh, to their systems, uh, which they are dependent on as much as anyone else. And uh, I think a, a new actor here, and I'd be curious for your assessment uh, too, Jessica, is the private sector. And we've had just incredible growth now in uh, the matter of a little more of a year with the number of you know, active satellites, particularly in low Earth orbit. Uh, uh, I have trouble, frankly, coming up with the, the, the correct number these days. It was you know, 4,000, now I've heard 4,800, now I've over 5,000. Uh, and uh, with the mega constellations uh, coming on in the next uh, few years already being established, uh, we have a powerful new player um, and stakeholder in responsible state action in outer space. Um, the likes of uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk uh, uh, will not be happy if irresponsible state behavior ends up destroying their business model or their commercial interests. And uh, I also like to remind uh, uh, individuals that, that uh, the industry, uh, particularly uh, big major corporations have never been shy of lobbying governments uh, uh, extensively uh, uh, when their commercial interests are being jeopardized. So I, I think um, that could be a new factor that uh, hitherto has not really been present uh, uh, in international uh, uh, international diplomacy on, on these questions. And again, you know, because I, I also fall on the cyber side, I think uh, it's striking how in recent years, uh, the IT industry has got much more engaged in these UN processes than had been the case and making very clear their sense of what are reasonable measures and, and uh, what are not. So we'll, we'll have to see how this, this plays out. Uh, and it's still not clear to what role civil society and private sector will really uh, have opportunities to input into the open-ended working group. And uh, you know, that, uh, again, remains to, to be seen. But whether they, they have a direct voice or not in the, in the proceedings, there are other ways in which they can make their views known. Yeah, that's the tricky part. I mean, I guess creative diplomacy <laughs> will be needed to bring in other stakeholders into a discussion that touches on all of us when it comes to arms control in space, but when the discussions happen sort of in state-based forums. And I know Planet was quite vocal about, well, all of the recent anti-satellite tests and the implications that it has for commercial actors. So I agree, I think it's positive. Um, turning more because th there have been a few questions about it, but we spoke a little bit about possible diplomatic fallout, but also maybe the good side of having our first substantive discussions at the UN on this topic in May and not say right now. Um, do you foresee other fallout in space from, from the, the war in Ukraine? Um, in 2014, this was a big question and we really saw, at least my perspective from working in, in the space community was that space was a little bit separate. It was insulated diplomatically in some ways from what happened on the ground. And I'm seeing a lot of chatter on social media as, as people are, you know, sorting through what's happening and processing, you know, is that going to hold? Or do we do we think there are going to be implications when it comes to say the International Space Station, which is the, you know, the beacon of international cooperation in outer space, or, you know, civil space launches and other cooperative programs going forward? Or does space stand apart? I'm not sure, and I'm curious what your take is. 
Well, I would hope that some elements uh, environmental and international cooperation can uh, be uh, sustained. Uh, but we have to recognize uh, that uh, the sanctions that are being uh, put together and, and applied uh, uh, will have um, impact on uh, Russia and uh, its uh, uh, space uh, program, be it uh, military or civilian. Uh, so that there will be some uh, consequences, but I, I tend to uh, think like you, Jessica, that there is a, a certain insulation that applies there with space um, that uh, no party will want to initiate armed conflict uh, in other space. And again, there's that uh, fundamental uh, common interest uh, in uh, avoiding uh, adding to the uh, hazardous uh, operating uh, conditions of other space. And I'm going to take, building on this conversation, I'm going to take a question from Scott Bryson, who um, maybe a little, a little more cynically asked about the value, I'm going to rephrase it slightly, but the value of trying to create arms control agreements that just at some point rather seem to be violated in the end. And so I guess, how do we how do we address the skeptics when it comes to arms control and the value that it has for restraining military activities? Uh, well, you know, I find, you know, some of that skepticism really, uh, you know, not all that warranted. I mean, you can apply to, you know, uh, you know our criminal code against crimes uh, is violated on a regular basis. So, you know, does anyone suggest that we should abandon that code? So uh, we have examples uh, of uh, cooperative security agreements that have fared very well. Others have had problems with violations. And then, you know, there are uh, responses. Uh, ultimately, almost every uh, international agreement has a provision for withdrawal from the said agreement if the state party to it feels it's um, has been uh, its interests are in peril through uh, non-observance uh, uh, non-compliance by by others so uh, there are opportunities for that uh, i'd like to think part of of course uh, uh, helping to prevent the, those occasions is uh, ensuring that they are precise, you know, well-defined, uh, that they are uh, capable of, of verification uh, where appropriate. And I think that um, there is uh, provisions for uh, responses in the case of a perceived violation, you know, initially often in the form of a commitments for clarification or consultation, but also uh, ultimately um, efforts at enforcement. But International diplomacy is all premised on uh, the uh, notion that you, you can't force a state into any agreement. So states uh, enter voluntarily, and uh, with that uh, voluntary entering is the assumption of responsibility that they are going to honor their commitments uh, and uh, that they will be uh, subject to uh, opprobrium if they do not. Uh, and I think uh, overall uh, that's uh, served, us, uh, served us well. So another diplomatic question. Um, Rahul asked another question about the meaning of consensus. And I, I'm interested to hear your views because I've been having side chats uh, over the last month or so with Alison Pitlick, who works with you a lot on cyber. And what consensus means? Is consensus about spoiling or is consensus, a, and is it about everybody agreeing or, or does it have a, a different meaning that might be easier to work with? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it has actually uh, some elasticity uh, to it. It's interpreted in different ways in different bodies. I think the, the conference in Sarmad operated on a rather extreme version of the consensus uh, rule where no decision, procedural or substantive, uh, could be taken without complete unanimity of the 65 members. I mean, you, you, you couldn't sneeze, you know, without uh, agreement in the conference uh, on, on disarmament. But in other uh, areas, uh, it's a looser interpretation. If uh, It's deemed that uh, there are states who may not uh, 
approve of what's happening, but can live with it. And in that uh, uh, context, sometimes a consensus is, is, uh, is perceived or announced, let's say, by the chair of a given negotiation. And I think it's evolving to the, the vast majority of states, I mean, the, following a kind of democratic principle that uh, majority will should not be stymied uh, by the minority, have um, increasingly moved on, on this. Uh, I give you the example of the arms trade uh, treaty, which uh, uh, was negotiated under a mandate that talked about consensus. And uh, years were spent in developing a, a, a draft accord uh, that was um, acceptable to the vast majority of those participating states. But you had three, I think it was Syria, North Korea, and Iran, that denied consensus at the last moment. So what happened? Did the states sort of uh, lament uh, this uh, breakdown and there would be no, no arms trade treaty to uh, 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 proceed? No, they then uh, took the text and put it into the General Assembly and had it adopted there. And we now have a very viable uh, multilateral uh, treaty. So I, I note that, that even when you know, consensus is specified um, it, it, as the uh, decision-making or operating procedure, uh, it can be uh, in fact handled in different ways. Yeah, creative diplomacy <laughs> and creative institutionalism. Um, there's another question. This sort of changes our topic a little bit, but I think it's still focused on diplomacy. Uh, Dwayne is asking about perspectives on competition for lunar resources. So I suppose the future of diplomacy as we aim higher <laughs> and, and wider in space as a, as a civilization and what we might expect. Oh, well, uh, here again, I think the importance of the uh, Outer Space Treaty in terms of some key principles that uh, the exploit exploitation and use of outer space is for uh, the benefit and the interests of all countries. So uh, you will have to, I think, demonstrate that. Uh, and uh, the Outer Space Institute has also um, made uh, known its um, urging that uh, we not simply have a set of fait accompli here, unilateral sort of moves, that we work out a uh, multilateral uh, framework to govern how space resources are to be employed. And I was uh, pleased that uh, the legal subcommittee of Copius uh, seems now to have agreed as part of their work program uh, that they will be uh, looking at uh, uh, legal uh, frameworks that could provide that multilateral governance of the exploitation of space resources. And I think that's, uh, that's indeed the preferred route to follow. So continuing the theme of sort of creative diplomacy and, and different institutions and rules, Vitaly has been asking about the impact of the admission of new members and the formation of new rules and procedures. I'm not I'm not sure I'm completely getting that, but I do know Encopios has been growing quite rapidly with the admission of new members who are dedicated to, to advancing rules in space. But I might broaden that and ask about the role of, you know, not just the traditional, but smaller spacefaring countries and in addition to private sector in space um, and the impact of bringing more voices to the table is the way I might phrase it myself. Well, I think it's, it's healthy. It's an uh, indication of uh, that uh, even, let's say, uh, smaller, um, maybe uh, less developed countries are now seeing the relevance of space uh, and space functionality for their own uh, uh, prosperity and development plans. And uh, they would like to, to have a, a seat at the table where some of uh, this policy is being developed. Uh, so um, I think that's... Uh, uh, that is generally uh, something to be welcomed. Uh, you know, yes, there are, are, are more voices then sometimes, you know, then agreements will be a little more uh, complex. Uh, I see that uh, we have on the call David Kendall, uh, a formal, uh, very uh, uh, successful chairperson of uh, Copius, and 
uh, very active in Canadian space policy. And uh, I know he would be quick to point out, you, know, you do have, again, a consensus uh, approach to the decision-making copious. And so the uh, admission of uh, any new members would have to uh, meet the approval of all the existing uh, members. So there, there may be you know, certain cases where you're not going to get uh, complete you know, a mirroring of uh, you know, the 193 member states of uh, the UN General Assembly, for instance. I'm going to take one more question from the floor before I give you a more positive um, note to end on, hopefully, because the question is a little bit dark. Um, Valentin has asked what the possibility is of, um, I'm thinking more a cyber attack in space, sort of preceding a more serious nuclear attack on Earth. And I know that you have spoken in other forums about the linkages between, between cyber nuclear and space. Um, it's a dark question, so we'll, we'll take that one and then we'll give you a closing word as well that might be more optimistic. Well, I'm not going to reveal here in the public uh, domain uh, the manner to have a cyber a spoofing attack on the nuclear early warning system. Uh, but I, I, as I suggested earlier, it's a challenge. I hope you know the first uh, step in uh, providing solutions to the problem is recognizing it as one. And I think that is uh, now uh, becoming apparent. I think, again, there have been some uh, eminently uh, logical uh, arms control proposals on this that have uh, been put forward. I think notably uh, a ban on any kind of uh, cyber penetration operation against uh, nuclear weapon control uh, facilities. Uh, and I think that would be a, a good place uh, for uh, those uh, powers that have such uh, offensive cyber capabilities to look at uh, agreeing on. Because you know, once again, it would be uh, incredibly destabilizing and uh, possibly uh, escalatory to uh, have a cyber uh, operation against a, a nuclear weapon system. Absolutely. Before we give it back to Space Watch Global, I'll just ask you quickly what you think the one thing is, <laughs> or the key thing, if you could say a key ingredient that we need to move forward on this topic as a world. Yeah, well, I know it's something of a cliche to say, but uh, a little injection of political will would be uh, very uh, helpful. <laughs> uh, I think there, again, are uh, uh, eminently appealing and compelling uh, practical reasons for uh, establishing some cooperative uh, security uh, uh, accords and arrangements. Uh, uh, but uh, you do need uh, to have political backing uh, for those. I was pleased to see Canada, for instance, uh, uh, renewing uh, its longstanding um, interest in proposals to uh, ban uh, ASAT testing. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, been uh, attractive if uh, Canada could sort of move beyond the espousal of the proposal to actually um, do the diplomatic uh, homework to uh, generate a coalition uh, to support it and, and put it into an appropriate forum. Maybe we'll see that now in the open-ended working group. I, I hope so. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it is uh, always the, the need, particularly when we're talking about uh, international multilateral diplomacy, to have some champions of this uh, going forward. And so I think uh, uh, having a, a country like Canada uh, take a degree of leadership on this would be uh, very uh, constructive. I would also note, as we discussed a little earlier, that the, the role of the private sector could be uh, beneficial to providing additional impetus and resources uh, to uh, take the first steps at restraint and cooperation. Well, we have about three months left to start mustering political will across all of our various countries and uh, and private sector as well before uh, before more substantive talks get underway. With that, um, optimistically, I think I will hand the floor back to Torsten to, to wish everyone well. Do you want to take command and control, Torsten? Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul, for this wonderful talk. Uh, really 
or enjoy this, this conversation you had. So uh, before you're switching off the audience, or uh, please see this incredible lineup we have prepared for you. So next week in the 33 minutes, I will speak with wonderful Emmanuel David and Dr. Minou are about the current status of the space sustainability rating. On the 4th of March, we have our next Space Cafe Benelux by uh, Chiara Munter and Banu Bazingi. And on the 8th of March, on the occasion of the International Women's Day, I have the great honor to, sp to talk in my 33 minutes with Simonetta Di Pippo uh, from UNOSAR. So, and then we continue this week on the 10th or in the very early morning hours for us in Europe with our next Space Cafe Australia by Annie Handmar. And on the 15th, or I will have a chat in the 33 minutes or with Dr. Andreas Wittmer from the University of St. Gallen. And then on our 100th Space Cafe 33 minutes, I have the absolute honor to speak live with the uh, ESA DG Josef Aschbacher. So and I can tell you I'm super excited already about that, as you can imagine. So I'm stopping here. Um, all these events are going to be online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to appreciate and to would like to hear your feedback and appreciate that as well. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something cool and very special, become a Space Wars Watcher and show your commitment to us. Um, thank you all for very much for your interest. And thank you very much, Jessica. You, you have been wonderful, uh, as always. And Paul, for this super inspiring talk. And with this, yeah, bit of peace and hope what i think is very important for all of us these these days especially here in europe and worldwide i hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy thanks for joining us hope to see you next week in the meantime visit our website and follow us on social media and don't forget become a space watcher thank you very much Bye bye. <laughs>